There are 400 species of anoles. A classic question for anole biologists and for evolutionary biologists in general is how do new species arise? How did we go from having one species to 400? Speciation is the process by which one species splits into two species. Basically, diversification has two parts. Speciation, which is the production of new species, and adaptation, how species adapt to where they live. Speciation plus adaptation equals biological diversity. In anoles, we know a lot more about adaptation than we do about how speciation occurs. And that's why our current research is focusing on speciation. There are many ways to define what a species is, and honestly, researchers disagree on the precise definition. But the one that I favor, and the one that's been around the longest, is reproductive isolation. That means that two species, when they come together, are unable to produce any offspring at all, or if they do produce offspring, they're infertile. A wild example would be a pairing between a walrus and a bird. They're, of course, not gonna produce any offspring. A more nuanced example, though, is uh, a commonly known one. Horse and donkey, when brought together, can produce mules. Mules are an offspring, but they're not fertile. They're never able to reproduce. Therefore, donkeys and horses are different species. And so in practice, speciation is the process by which barriers arise between populations that prevent them from interbreeding. There can be lots of different anole species living together in the same forest. And so the lizards have a problem. How do they tell members of their own species from members of other species? They don't want to waste time courting a female of the wrong species or doing battle with a male. Anoles identify members of their own species in two ways. One is the dewlap. Whenever you see species of anoles living together, they always differ in their dewlap, either the size of the dewlap, the color, or the pattern. Learn your dewlap colors. You can just basically tell which species it is without seeing anything else. If you tell me I caught this lizard in Puerto Rico and I have a red dewlap, I will say it's a nice book colors. Do you have to see it? No, don't worry. I'm sure. Or if you tell me I caught this anole in Puerto Rico and it got this dewlap that looks sort of drab and brown, I say, yeah, that's the beautiful anole, it's gone lucky. It's a species recognition signal. That's the idea. This is my color, I'm this species. Similarly, the pattern by which they bob their heads up and down when they display to each other. Some are jiggle, 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 big. Some are big, slow, big, slow. Each species has its own pattern. And so by looking at the dewlap and the head bobbing pattern, an individual can know whether another lizard is a member of its own species or not. A great example comes from two species of anoles in the Dominican Republic, Anolis cybodes and Anolis marcanoi. And if you looked at them from a distance, they look identical. However, when they stick out their dewlap, cybodes has a white dewlap with a pale yellow wash, and marcanoi has a very red dewlap. So the dewlaps are very different. If you put two cybodes together, they fought like cats and dogs. And you put marcanoi together, and they fought. But you put a Marcanoi and a Cybodes together and they'd kind of go, stick out their dewlap, and that was about it. It's like they said, oh, wrong species, not worried about you. Then we did this experiment where we changed the color of the dewlap. And we did that with the Cybodes. We pulled out its dewlap and we took red coral lipstick and just smeared the red lipstick on the dewlap to make it red like Marcanoi. And then you put it in with a Marcanoi and then they fought. And you did the same thing to the Marcanoi, you, you made its dewlap whiter with clown makeup. And so changing the color of the dewlap did actually fool them into thinking that lizards that weren't their own species really were. Now, what this suggests is that the evolution of the dewlap may play an important role in the speciation process. The classic view of speciation has been that it occurs in populations that are isolated, physically isolated from one another geographically. Over time, genetic differences accumulate in those isolated populations to the point where if they were to come back into secondary contact, they're no longer able to interbreed. More recently, we've come to understand 
that adaptation and natural selection play an important role in the evolution of new species. One such theory is ecological speciation. And that says that adaptation to distinct habitats while populations are in isolation generate the changes that when brought back into contact result in populations being infertile when they pair with one another. So the current debate is which of these processes is more important, isolation or divergent natural selection? Right now, we're in the midst of a very large experiment to understand the relative importance of the classic model of speciation and the adaptive ecological speciation hypothesis. The classic model emphasizes random genetic changes that occur between populations. To actually see those changes, we need to get genome sequences and compare them between populations. So the genome is an important tool in studying speciation. An organism's genome is the sum total of all of the genes in that organism, and they're responsible for making the organism what it is. The anole genome was the first reptile genome to be sequenced. It's fairly large, it's 2.2 billion bases, and in those there are about 18,000 genes. That's actually quite similar to the number of uh, genes that humans have. Our current experiment is set up so that we have a number of populations. Some of them occur in similar environments, but have been isolated for a long time. Others occur in different environments, but haven't been isolated for that long. First, we'll measure how genetically different they are. Second, we'll measure how ecologically different they are. And then third, we'll measure the degree to which each pair of populations is reproductively isolated. Seeing if they will mate, see if they will lay eggs, and if the eggs will, will hatch out and produce fertile offspring. Under the classic model, we would expect to find that genetic differences are driving the evolution of reproductive isolation. In contrast, under the ecological speciation model, we expect ecological differences to play a more important role. We're still in the middle of this experiment, but previous research we've done has shown that populations of the same species that have adapted to different environments do show substantial amounts of reproductive isolation. Therefore, adaptation to new ecological environments can play an important role in how new species arise. It's important to study speciation because new adaptations arise, but they can only persist if populations are prevented from exchanging genes. A lot about what we love about nature is, is the diversity of life that exists. And speciation is the process by which that diversity is able to be maintained.